Um, recently, I was in America uh, at a conference, um, and it was so good. And um, I came across a concept that I'd never, I'd never heard of. You probably have. And uh, the concept is the dad bod. Does anyone know what a dad bod is? Anyone know what a dad bod is? Okay, some of you will have heard this concept. Basically, the dictionary defines a dad bod as a male physique that is relatively slim but not lean or toned. Does anybody have a dad bod? A male <laughs> the Urban Dictionary defines it as a male body type that is best described as softly round. <laughs> Built on the theory that once a man has found a mate and fathered a child, he doesn't need to worry about sustaining a sculptured physique. Like I had one before that. That's what I want to say. It goes on to say, if bodies were meat, dad bod would be more marbled ribeye than filet mignon. More mashed potato than skinny fry. Anyone resonating now with a dad bod? A dad bod is a nice balance between working out and keeping a beer gut. Look around the room. <laughs> but here's the thing. If I want a different body, I have to understand there are two different dimensions to a different body. One is calories in, and one is calories out. Calories in have to be balanced by calories out if I want to be healthy, and if I want a different kind of body. There are two environments uh, it, it, that we have to understand. You see, the environment, there's this environment, which is the easy chair or the couch. How many of you like that environment? And here's where, if you're like me, when you're sat on your couch or in your easy chair at night at home, it's all about consuming, isn't it? It's all about consuming content. So you're watching like your favorite box set, like for us, Game of Cards, okay? And we're watching our favorite box set. Some of you know where I'm going there. And you've got your remote control, so you don't even have to move. Do you remember the days when the remote control was on a little wire? Does anyone ever remember that? And it was like literally this long, and you were in front of the TV. Some of you young people haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. So you've got your remote control, you've got your Doritos, uh, and it's all about consuming. And I don't know about you, but my difficulty with diet is often at night. Anyone identify with that? It's often when I'm on the, the chair or, in the, or on the couch, and at night, and especially if I'm watching the TV, I want to eat, and it's calories in, calories in. But there is another environment that we need to be aware of, and um, that's the environment of the gym. And here's the thing. Okay, I said don't put heavy weights on. There you go. And you see, calories out is where actually I'm going to get changed. Calories in are really important, but calories in are never going to give me the kind of physique or health that I want. It's only calories out. We have to balance calories in with calories out. Am I right? Am I right? Now, here's the thing. Calories in are okay. We have to take calories in. So this guy, Michael Phelps, anyone remember Michael Phelps, swimmer? 12,000 calories a day. 12,000 calories a day this geezer consumed. But that's okay because he balanced it with calories out. This guy here, that's who I'm modeling myself after, The Rock, 5,000 calories a day every single day of his life, minimum. That's a lot of calories. That's a lot of calories. In fact, when we were in America, I was with a friend of mine, another church leader, and he'd never been to the Cheesecake Factory, which is a restaurant, a chain in America. And so I took him for a piece of cheesecake. And as we looked at this piece of cheesecake, on the menu, it said how many calories one slice of cheesecake was. 1,500 calories for one slice of cheesecake. It's Amer No wonder one in three Americans weighs as much as the other two. I'm just moving on. I'm only joking. If you're Americans, I'm only joking. Here's the thing, you see. Calories in are okay, but you have to balance calories in with calories out. I'm never going to get fit if I only sit here. If I only consume calories, I'm never going to get fit. I have to learn what it is to move between calories in and calories out. And that's what I want to look at with you this morning. Because over the last few weeks, I don't know about you, but I think we've had some great calories in in this series, Living Your Best Life. So if you think back to week one... I spoke about choosing well from the story of Moses. And we looked at this idea that if the choices you make today will shape the tomorrow that you experience. And then Andy looked at the whole thing of comparison. 
And, and you'll, never be, you'll never live your best life if you're trying to live somebody else's life. You can only live the life that God has given you to live. So stop pretending to be someone else. That's great calories in. That's great input into our life. The week after that, if you're at Hagley, Joe, our location pastor, did a great job of talking about being vulnerable and the power of vulnerability. Great input, great calories in. And for those of us that here at Hal Zoe in Boyd uh, from New Zealand spoke about being faithful from the life of Noah. Anyone remember that? You were here. Uh, don't do shortcuts. You know, be faithful to what God has given you and what God has said to you. Great calories in. And then last week, Jane and then Jess at Rowley and Hagley both did the same talk uh, on the Good Samaritan. Uh, and you will live your best life when you love beyond yourself. All of that was incredible calories in. That was like content. That's what we do. We consume content. None of that will change you. None of that will give you your best life unless you work it out. Calories in has to be balanced with calories out. So what does it mean to work it out? How are we going to do that? I want to show you from the scripture what I believe is the key to living your best life. So we're going to go to the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Now, this is really interesting because this is the Apostle Paul who's um, often, and in this situation, was in a prison. And he's writing to people um, in, in Philippi, in the, in the church, in the, one of the early churches. And he says this, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. And here's a promise. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. Just hold it there. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Then you will live my best life, is what he's saying. But if he's saying, then you will shine them on them like the stars, we have to understand what is the before that produces the then. So let's go back to verse 12 and 13, and here's the key. Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to say the words with me. Work, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Hold it. Paul says, work out your salvation, for it is God who works in. And here's my big idea this morning. If we're going to live our best life, the next slide, Loris, please. Work out what God is working in. Does that make sense? You've got to work out what God is working in. It is no use just having calories in. And what we do spiritually is we do exactly the same thing as we do physically. So what we do is that we say spiritually, so we get the problem with the couch, the problem with the chair, is that this is all about consuming content. And so what we do is we listen to talks, and we listen to podcasts, and we listen to worship CDs, and we read books, and that is all absolutely brilliant. It won't change you spiritually one iota, unless you work out what God is working in. Does that make sense? Unless we work out what God is working in, all we're doing is consuming calories, getting fatter, but we are not getting healthier, and we're not living our best life, the life that Jesus wants us to live. Now, I want to say to you, really important, it's really important that we consume calories, if you're ill, if you're sick, you know one of the challenges is you don't feel like eating. And one of the things that you need to do more than anything else when you're sick or when you're ill is you need to eat. But you don't feel like it. So it's really, really important to consume calories. Spiritually, guys, it's really important. And I want to say to you guys that things for us like encounter is really important. You know, the thing with podcasts, and I listen to podcasts all the time. I listen to more than probably most of you do because I just, I just do it. I consume it so much. I'm listening to podcasts most days of my life. I'm reading Christian books most days of my life. And that's really important. But you cannot podcast an experience. You can podcast content, but you cannot podcast an experience. So things like encounter are really important because they're not just about content, they're about an experience with God as well. But encounter 
and coming to church and listening to talks and listening to worship albums will not make us spiritually the people we want to be. Because the, prom- the problem with the couch is that we just consume content. The promise of the gym is that we work content out and so it becomes healthy and effective in our lives. You see, the problem is many Christians think that being deep means that I sit on the couch and consume lots of content. Deep is not how much content we consume. Deep is how much content we apply. And we will only do that by... I'm going to leave that now. That's going to kill me. By working out what God is working in. Does that make any sense? So I want to share share with you this morning. How can we work out what God is working in? And before we do that, let me make it really clear... We are not earning our salvation by working it out. In fact, this is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Look, those who are being saved. So we're not earning our salvation by working at it, but we are working out the free gift that God has given us. If you're not yet a Christian this morning, being a follower of Jesus is not something you can earn. It is something you receive. Isn't that right? It's grace. But when you receive it, you then work it out. And there are so many people that become followers of Jesus and then stop following Jesus. And so we do is we just sit in the couch and we receive and we consume, but we never move into the gym and we never work it out. And so we wonder why we've got spiritual dad bods. Because actually we've never worked out what God is working in. And I don't know how to, how to communicate this to you, but this is so, so important. This could literally change your life. If you worked out what God was working in, it will change your life. But here's the thing, and I'm aware that some of you are not yet Christians, but I want to speak to those of you that have been Christians a long time. Are you still following Jesus? I don't mean do you believe in Him. I mean are you still following Him? Are you still being saved? Are you still growing in your relationship with Jesus? There's a, an old story that I love about a little kid that fell out of bed. And, and um, I've told you this is many times. I just love it. And his mom came and put him back into bed. And as she was tucking him in, she said, why do you think you fell out of bed? And he just says in this little childlike innocence, I guess I stayed too long to where I got in. So he like gets in the bed on the end and doesn't move in. And how many of us as followers of Jesus... Get into the bed and then just stay where we got in rather than move in, rather than move in. And I just wonder this morning, could it be at the end of this series, and I'm going to talk about the next series because the next series is crucial to this as well. I'm I'm going to use today as a pivot because the reality is you could have heard all the content of the last series, whether you were here or whether you heard it on podcast or watched it on YouTube, and you can hear all the content of the next series, and you can consume it all, and you can sit on your couch or your chair, and you can just drink it all in and consume it all, and you won't change one iota. Because you've got to work out what God is working in. You've got to work out what God is working in. So how do we do that? I want to give you four things this morning, okay? Number one, you've got to apply what you're learning. You've got to apply what you're learning. You listen to it and you learn it. If you don't apply it, it's just calories in, it's not calories out. And nothing, nothing will change. Information does not produce transformation. Only application does that. Uh, another guy that writes a lot in the Bible, uh, James, one of the early apostles, he writes in James 1.22, this, don't just listen to the word of truth. This is the Passion Translation, which you know I love. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. For that is the essence of self-deception. So always let his word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. Isn't that beautiful? So in other words, it's like, don't just listen to it. Don't just consume it, work it out, apply it into your life. How do you do that? This is really difficult. And me and Alison went out for coffee yesterday morning and we were having a conversation about this and, and we, we think differently about this, but that's okay. She's allowed to be wrong. It's fine. No, I'm joking. That's a joke. And we come at it from different angles, but actually we, we got to a point where we thought, actually, There's the same point there. And here's the point. How do we do it? What you do is when you're listening to truth, whether that's from the Word of God or whether you're reading it or whether you're listening to podcasts or right now, lean in and absorb. For me, I write things down. For her, she never does. 
So whether that works for you or doesn't work for you, but the key thing is lean in and absorb. And then the second thing is act on what you've heard. Does that make sense? Unless you act on what you've heard, it's just calories in and nothing, nothing will change. We had a great connect group this week. We, me and Alison just started a connect group with a bunch of other people and we're loving the experience of that. And, and we sat around uh, in someone's living room and we said, hey, you know with what Jane shared last Sunday morning, we were all, we're all based in Hal Zoe, and, you know, what, what, what impacted you and, and what are you going to do with it? And it was so good going around the circle, listening to different ones saying, this is what really spoke to me. But then the next question is, and what are you going to do with what God spoke to you about? And that's where the game is won or lost, isn't it? And so for me, what spoke to me the most about, and I wrote down most of what Jane said, but what spoke to me the most last week was that idea that maybe I am the robber on the ground. That's a real flip on that whole story. And the great thing about Jesus is that when you look at a story of Jesus, you can identify with all the characters. Sometimes I've been the priest. Sometimes I've been the Levite. Sometimes I've been the good Samaritan. But maybe I'm also the robber who didn't deserve grace and mercy, but Jesus gave it to me anyway. And that really hit me because I thought, I shared in the group, sometimes, this is just me, sometimes I kind of say on the inside, if I don't say it on the outside, yeah, but they don't really deserve that. And Jesus spoke to me powerfully last week and said, and neither Leon do you. So I sat in the connect group and said, but you know what, that, that I lent in and I absorbed that. But now what I need to do is when in my next situation, when I'm with somebody that maybe I think doesn't deserve it, I need Jesus to remind me that neither do I and I need to give it to them anyway. And what I'm saying is that unless we work out what God is working in, nothing will change. And living our best life only comes when we work out what God is working in. Many Christians come to events and conferences and they want a new word from God. And I often want to say, and what are you doing with the last word that God told you? Because maybe God withholds saying something new until you've worked out what God has already said into your life. So apply what you're learning. Secondly, use what you've been given. Many of the stories of Jesus that we call parables speak into this principle God has invested himself into us, time and treasures and talents. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. And um, one of the, the parables that Jesus told in Luke 12, look at this from the message. This is really graphic. The servant who knows what his master wants and ignores it or incidentally does whatever he pleases will be thoroughly thrashed. That sounds very old English, doesn't it? A bit of John Cleese there, thoroughly thrashed. But if he does a poor job through ignorance, he'll get off with a slap on the hand. Great gifts mean great responsibilities. Greater gifts, greater responsibilities. In other words, what you've been given, okay, what you've consumed and received, you need to then do something with it. You need to go and work it out. And so maybe for some of us, maybe that means taking the money that God has given us and saying, do you know what? I'm going to work it out. That means I'm going to give properly. I'm going to give sacrificially. I'm going to give generously. And in the working out, what I'm doing is I'm proving whether Jesus is my master and Lord or whether he's not. I'm also developing the muscles of faith and of acceptance and of trust in God. And so I'm going to give to God even when life is tough. I'm going to honour God with my giving even when I don't want to do it. When I want to do other things, because I'm actually working out the muscles of trust and dependency on God. Maybe for some of you, you know that you've got gifts and skills and passions. Maybe you're not doing anything with them. Maybe the way that you can use what you've been given is by serving. Uh, And we would love to help you with that, which is why I mentioned earlier on about our getting involved card. And you can just fill that in in the connection point and someone will contact you. And that's one of the ways that you could use what you've been given and make a difference for the kingdom of God. And when you do that, you're exercising the muscles. You're taking what God has put in you and you're working out. You're working out what God is working in. You know, I think one of the other ways is, is when we actually share the good news about Jesus with others who don't know Jesus. 
And I'm aware some of you might not know Jesus yet this morning. And the reason that we talk about sharing our faith isn't because we're out to get people, but we want something for them, not something from them. Because we've discovered a relationship with Jesus which is so transforming and powerful that we want everybody to know about it. Just um, last week... Um, we were up at Elim Conference, the Leaders Conference in Harrogate there, and several of us went out for a meal at a restaurant, same restaurant we normally go to when we're there, and, and we're trying to build a relationship with whoever's there, and, and we had this conversation with one of the waitresses, and, and she asked us where, where we were and what we were doing, and we, it got onto faith, and, uh, and then we asked her the question, do you have faith? And um, she was from overseas, and it was a really interesting conversation. She said, I guess there must be something when I die. I just don't know what it is. And so we got into a great conversation. And again, when you do that, you feel like you're exercising your muscles. Does it make sense? You feel like you're working out a bit of what God's been working in. Wouldn't it be incredible if every single day of my life and your life, we worked out what God was working in. We used what we've got in order to make a difference. Third thing I want to share is hold yourself accountable. This is crucial. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. And the problem is that, that I can say, when I'm sat in a couch here and God speaks to me, okay, spiritually, and something drops into my life, and uh, sorry, I'm going to keep messing you about with the lights there, aren't I? <laughs> keep you on your toes, boys. And, and, and I can, I can you know, hear something from God, and I think, oh, yeah, that's great. I I need to work that out now. The problem is the heart is deceitful. And sometimes we need someone else to hold us to account. Anyone ever experienced that? Because on our own, we're not going to do it. What we need to do is to put ourselves in a place where someone else knows what God is saying in us and can help us to work that thing out. So I'll give you another example from my life. Recently, we've, I've set up a, a little group of leaders that I'm connecting with and coaching with from other churches, and, and, and we've committed to meeting together, and, uh, and we're pouring into each other with the idea to help each other grow and help our churches grow. And uh, at, the, at the last session that we had, we went around and we talked about where are we winning and where are we being challenged? And when it got to where we were being challenged, several people shared things that they were challenged of in their life. And then we just sat around and thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we held each other accountable to what we said we're going to do? So on the WhatsApp group, uh, somebody who, who, who said, I've stopped reading books, has, has put a photograph of the two books that they're reading this month. I shared the fact that, that often I'm reading the Bible for talks rather than reading the Bible for itself. And I'd got myself into that. And so when I was in America, I bought a proper Bible. One that you don't have to switch on with your finger, a real Bible with paper. And I'm only reading that just for reading that, not for talks. And so I sent a picture of that. But what we were doing by that is we were holding each other accountable to growth. And I want to say to you, if you're going to work out what God is working in, somebody else needs to join you on that journey. So why don't you find somebody, maybe in your connect group or maybe in your life, a friend or something that can hold you to account so that you can grow into the person that God wants you to become. And then the final thing I want to say, and I've agonized a little bit with whether this is the right word or not, but I'm going to throw it out there. Put yourself in what I want to call thin places. Now, now that phrase is taken from Celtic Christianity. The Celtic Christians, centuries and centuries ago, they used to call, um, they used to say that there were spaces and places that were thin places. And by that they meant there were places where heaven seemed to meet earth. Often for them it was monasteries and islands and remote places. But I think there are other thin places where heaven meets earth. And in my experience, thin places are usually where I step out of my comfort zone and where I'm more aware and more trusting and reliant on God. Those are the thin places. Those are the places where heaven seems to meet earth. You see, this ain't a thin place. This ain't a thin place. This is a comfortable place. And there's nothing wrong with comfort. There really isn't. But this is a place where I'm going to consume and I'm going to talk about changing the world. And I'm going to talk about praying for my, Christ, for my non-Christian family and friends and neighbours. But this is not a thin place. This is a safe place. This is a comfortable place. I'll tell you what a thin place is. The thin place is when I get up out of that chair and I walk across a room and I begin to share my faith with someone. That's a thin place. A thin place is what the guys in Albania have done. On Friday morning, we, I prayed for them outside and all of them were really nervous about going. But they're putting themselves in a thin place. 
Because they're stepping out of the boat, out of their comfort zone, and they're trusting and relying on who Jesus is. And when you do that, you begin to work out what God is working in. I think as a church, we put ourselves in some thin places over these last few years. I think we've pushed ourselves out there and we've done some things for the first time and we're trying to experiment and we're, and we're taking a risk and we're running an alpha in a pub in Hagley and we're, we're repurposing the church in Rowley and we're taking on a church in Albania and there's other things happening as well around the world. We're contemplating all other kinds of exciting things in different parts of the world and we're putting ourselves out there and in the putting yourself out there you discover that that's where often Jesus meets you the most. So I want to encourage some of you guys. Maybe you haven't put yourself in a thin place for a long time. You can. You can. And when you do, you begin to work out what God is working in. So I want to finish. And then we're going to sing in a moment. I want to finish by challenging you. Earn your calories. Earn your calories. Not earn your salvation. Not earn favour from God. You've got that. That's a gift. But earn your calories. Work out what God is working in. How do you do that? How do you do that? Number one, apply what you're learning. Next week, we start a series called Habitudes. Let me just give you a little bit of a heads up, all right? The guy Keith, who's speaking next week, is a good friend of mine now. Uh, he ran a series at his church in Texas called Habits. I really liked it. I nicked it. He gave me his material freely because we're friends. And then I realized, that's such a great talk you've done. I'm going to do that talk on the first week, June the 2nd. And then I realized he was going to be here on June the 2nd. Then I thought, that could be awkward, me doing his talk while he's in the room. So I thought, Keith, will you do that talk? Because you wrote it anyway. But I want to encourage you, over the next five weeks, we're going to look at some incredible habitudes, which is an attitude and a habit put together, and it is a real word, a habitude. And if you put these habitudes in your life, it will change your life. Apply what you've learned. So we're going to look at growth. We're going to look at courage. We're going to look at a healthy diet. We're going to look at gratitude. We're going to look at stewardship. These are habits that if we apply them in our life, will literally change our life. And then secondly, use what you've been given. You know, you guys have been given time. You've been given some treasures. You've been given some talents. Let's use it for the kingdom of God. If we do that, we will move from calories in to calories out. And we'll become the people God and we want us to be. The third one is to hold yourself accountable. I want to encourage you to, to let someone else into your spiritual life. You know, I'm meeting this week with a guy. And we've been walking together for about 25 years. Uh, he lives in a different part of the country. And often when we meet and connect, we'll ask each other questions about, about our sex life and about our marriage and about our devotional life and about how we handle our money. Uh, and not all the time. Like, we'll talk about football as well. Well, hopefully, depending on how it goes tomorrow. That's a different subject. But, but that holding yourself accountable is so, so important. Is there anyone else? who knows the journey that you're on, who can hold you to account. And then finally, take a risk. Take a risk. Step out the boat. You know, we're, we're going to launch another trip in the autumn to Albania. And then we're going to launch our first trip in February to India. We're partnering with an Elim Global project there where I was there in February. And we're going to take, I'm going to take a, a small team out there again, incredibly out of your comfort zone, out of my comfort zone as well. These are opportunities where we can take a risk but you don't have to go to India to, to get out the boat. You can just go knock on your neighbor's door. You can just go talk to somebody in the workplace. You can just go and be kind to somebody. You can just go and, and do something for the first time. But when we do that, when we do that, we put ourselves in the thin place and we experience Jesus together. So, so I want to finish with this. If you want to live your best life, you can sit in the chair the rest of your life and get fat. And you can consume and can consume and consume and consume. And all that will happen is it will be calories in. And nothing will change. And you'll have so much content, but that doesn't mean that you're becoming the person that Jesus or that you really want you to become. The thing that changes is when you get out of the chair and you get into the spiritual gym and you begin to say, I want to work out what God is working in.